Hotel Room 12, floor by Mom Keg. I'm going to start by leaving just a complete copy of the poem here. So if you want to refer back to it, you have got the full text. And if we start by just looking at a quick overview of what this poem is. It was published in 1968 and it's written in three stanzas of free verse, which means that we're not looking for a particular rhyme scheme, we're not looking for a particular metre, we're not looking for a regular pattern of numbers of lines in stanzas. And it's written in the first person, so it's narrated as though the character who is telling it is is the poet. It narrates the speaker's observations of Manhattan in New York, initially in daylight in the first stanza, and then again in darkness after midnight comes. And really it conveys quite a negative overall impression of life in the city, as the speaker seems to see it. It begins with the words, This morning... And the whole of this first stanza is one sentence, and the whole thing has this real sense of urgency and immediacy. And the fact that it begins with the words, this morning, the narrator is keen to tell quickly what he has seen. And the speaker is quite detached from the events that he is observing. There is this sense of him being kind of insulated or isolated in this hotel bedroom so that he's not a part of the events, he's, he is literally just an observer. And he says that I watched from here, so he is telling it from the hotel room where he's looking out of the window. And what did he watch? He watched a helicopter skirting like a damaged insect round the Empire State Building. The helicopter is in itself a symbol of wealth and power. And he talks about it skirting the building. Now, this is kind of metaphorical. It has feminine connotations of a a skirt circling round something, but also being vulnerable to the wind in the way that, you know, your fabric of your skirt could blow, that the helicopter is perhaps vulnerable. And the simile of the damaged insect He characterises this helicopter as being something small or fragile or perhaps vulnerable. Maybe he sees it as looking like an insect. It has rotors like an insect's wings. I kind of see it as being a bit like a daddy long legs. But it has no legs. So it's an image from the natural world where McCaig is often much more comfortable, but it's compromised by the fact that it's damaged. And... This sentence contains a bit of inversion so that he explains and expands on the idea of the insect before we see the direct object of the sentence and what it is that the helicopter is skirting. We move on to the next line and he tells us that what the helicopter is skirting is the Empire State Building and he then expands on that with this metaphor comparing it to a jumbo-sized dentist's drill. Now, In the 1970s skyline, the Empire State Building is the tallest thing on there. It's 103 storeys. It's a massive thing. It's symbolic of America's power and wealth, and at the time it's advanced technology to be able to build such a thing. But McCaig mocks it. There's this massive Art Deco landmark that he diminishes by using this metaphor of a dentist's drill, something that's you know, barely 30 centimetres long, and the connotations that it has of pain and suffering. If you're having your teeth drilled, you have toothache. And he suggests he's not impressed by this display of power and wealth by using this metaphor, which kind of mocks it a bit. It lands on the roof of the Pan Am skyscraper, and the Pan Am skyscraper was another massive landmark on the Manhattan skyline. It's now called the MetLife Building. It was, at the time of the poem, owned by Pan American World Airways, and its presence highlights the international influence and the connectedness of New York, that you've got this airways company sort of sitting in in the middle of the skyline. The helipad on the roof was used by the rich and influential, quite often being ferried out to the airport for an onward flight. And it's interesting because it has associations for a modern reader that McCaig didn't know. 
1977, so nine years after this poem was published, there was a horrible accident and a helicopter landing on the roof of the Pan Am skyscraper flipped over and its rotors sheared off and five people died. And as a result of that, um, flights were suspended from the Pan Am skyscraper and, and didn't really resume. One of the rotors that sheared off fell into the street below and actually killed somebody down there. But I do wonder, when McCaig talks about it being a damaged insect, whether he has perhaps considered the fact that this doesn't look terribly safe, despite all the money and despite all the influence that it seems to embody. Then we move into the second stanza, and there's a real switch in mood and a real switch in time. So we move from the morning when he's been watching the helicopter to midnight, and darkness has fallen. And this second stanza starts with the word but. But always sort of signals a change of mood, a change of direction in the argument. Midnight is significant because midnight is always significant in literature. It's the hour of witches, it's the hour of werewolves, it's the hour of danger. And there's something about that change that happens at midnight where you go from one day to the next and the darkest, sort of deepest, darkest time of the night, there's something always significant about it. And here he personifies it, and McCaig personifies it like a guest arriving in an airport. It's come in from foreign places. And the use of the word foreign, these are unfamiliar places which might be less civilised. There's a sense of danger comes in with midnight. And midnight arriving... Arriving at an airport, there's a sense of coming from other time zones. I think just the reference to the time in the context. It still gives us that sense of global connection that New York at midnight is still a hub of activity and a hub of transport and connectedness. But the humour has gone in this stanza. That sort of sense of playful messing about with metaphor that was there in stanza one, he's not doing that anymore. He talks about the uncivilised darkness that midnight has brought in with it, and it is shot at by a million lit windows. So immediately in the um, use of the word shot at, we get the connotations of gun violence. And he starts to introduce one of the links that's a key theme of this poem, this link between darkness and savagery, and a conflict between savagery and civilization which is reflected in the contrast between darkness and light. And there's a sense that even a million lit windows shooting at the darkness are not enough. And here we get just a bit of a visual idea of the skyline that he was seeing and the million lit windows all ups and acrosses. And this ups and acrosses combined with this pattern of white squares and dark squares perhaps suggests a crossword puzzle. And maybe there's something puzzling about this city that McCaig is struggling to solve and to feel that he's really got to the bottom of it. Normally when you're talking about a crossword, you would talk about down and across, not up. Why? I think it's because he's actually, he's only on the 12th floor. There's an awful lot of up to the city above him. If you think about the fact that the Pan Am skyscraper is 59 stories, the Empire State Building is 103. From the 12th floor, there's still a lot of up to see. But midnight is not so easily defeated. This is the shortest sentence in the poem, and I'm sure that that's significant because he's drawing attention to the fact that midnight is still personified and the darkness is bigger and stronger than the light. However many windows are shooting at the darkness, the darkness is not defeated. Then he comes back to a more personal observation. I lie in bed between a radio and a television set. And those words, between a radio and a television set, are between parenthetical commas. And I think it's important that he is surrounded by modern technology. In a sense, he is bracketed by it. He is a parenthesis himself, and in the same way that you can take a parenthesis out of a sentence without affecting its grammatical integrity, 
McKay could be taken out of this scenario. He's isolated in this hotel room. He is irrelevant to everything that's happening. He has no part in the action. He is just an observer. So the sense that he is kind of in parenthesis between the radio and the television set, surrounded by modern technology, it just adds to that sense of isolation. But what he hears... The wildest of war whoops continually ululating. Here he's creating a semantic field of the Wild West. And bear in mind, that's a lot of what people felt they knew culturally about America. What Hollywood chose to present. And a lot of it was sort of frontier battles between civilization and savagery. Which side of these battles you see as civilization and which you see as savagery is perhaps open to a different interpretation now from when this poem was written. But there were still these constant ongoing battles as the pioneers who'd um, arrived in America began to spread west. And the west was always the frontier. There's quite a lot of sound patterning in this line. There's the alliteration of W's and L's, the wildest of war whoops, continually ululating. And I think the pattern, the, the alliteration, the assonance, the onomatopoeia of it all suggests the cries of Native Americans and the calls that they used to communicate over long distance. And it reminds us of those stereotypical tropes of the Wild West films. He talks about these war whoops through the glittering canyons and gulches. The canyons and gulches fit with the ideas of the Wild West films and continue that semantic field, but glittering is unexpected. He's not watching a film. It might sound like the rocky settings of the Wild West movies, but I think the glittering refers to the shiny glass buildings of the city below him. And he definitely sees some equivalence between the alleyways and the streets below him with those sort of canyons, with the, the rock walls that characters tended to move through in films in quite a cinematic way. There is quite a, a, a sort of equivalence that you see. And there are police cars and ambulances racing. So these wailing sounds are not Native Americans on horses they are sirens, and the verb racing suggests this dramatic sense of urgency, and there are a lot of emergency vehicles rushing around the city, police cars and ambulances racing to the broken bones, the harsh screaming from cold water flats, the blood glazed on sidewalks. Here he uses synecdoche, the idea that you take a part of somebody to represent the whole, and the part that's being used, the broken bones, the injuries, the harsh screaming that people are making in hideous violent situations, and the blood. So these human beings are reduced to a list of their injuries, their screams, their spilled blood. These are maybe details that the ambulances would need to know what kind of emergency they're attending, but it still, I think, dehumanises the victims because we realise that the emergency workers are desensitised to the violence and the suffering. The cold water flats contrasts the extreme poverty that these people are enduring with the conspicuous wealth that we saw in the morning with the helicopter. And technology has left these people behind. These are cold water flats because they don't even have access to hot water. So the chances are they're probably unheated as well. They're pretty grim places to be living. And when he talks about blood glazed on sidewalks, you get the idea of the dried blood being a sort of durable, shiny coating, like a glaze on pottery that's hard and shiny and kind of baked on to last. The idea that the blood will be there, it's a kind of permanent presence it's quite a grim picture that he's painting of what's happening in the streets below him at midnight. And he concludes in the final stanza with these lines, The frontier is never somewhere else, and no stockades can keep the midnight out. The idea that wherever there are humans, there is a boundary between savagery and civilization, 
and the line break. The frontier is never somewhere else. I think suggests I almost want to use air quotes with that. Somewhere else. Distancing ourselves from it. It's not here. It's not part of my life. But he's saying it is. Wherever there are humans, the frontier is with us. And no stockades can keep the midnight out. Stockades were theoretically designed to keep animals in, but also designed to keep humans out. And they were big, sturdy structures made of, sort of chunks of trees sharpened like pencils. And a fence cannot hold back darkness, however sturdily made it is. We cannot build anything that will keep our savagery at bay. So it's quite a, a bleak conclusion that he comes to about human nature, that we try very hard to build civilization and to keep the darkness, the metaphorical darkness, out. But he doesn't seem to think it's possible. Now, if we look quickly at the themes and techniques, if you're answering exam questions on this poem, the themes, human nature... McCaig is a very adept observer of human nature, and he contrasts civilization and savagery, darkness and light, wealth and poverty, themes that run throughout this poem. He also sees violence as a constant theme of human nature and of human existence, and also from the fact that he is separated from it all and he's up there in his 12th floor bedroom, the idea of isolation. Talking about techniques, it's obvious from the list on the left that contrast is significant. And if you're talking about contrast in an exam, you need to mention the two things he contrasts in this poem. So any one of those three pairs would do very nicely. Use of imagery. There are several instances of imagery that you could pick up from this poem. You could pick up the metaphor of the dentist's drill. You could pick up the personification of midnight there are metaphors and things that you could easily write about. And the other technique that I think you could pick up would be the first-person narrative. And it's something that you see again in Basking Shark or in Aunt Julia, that narrating it as a, a first-person observer and commentator is quite a key technique that McCaig uses quite frequently. I hope that was helpful. If you are writing on this in an exam, I wish you the best of luck. Mm -hmm.